Uh, thanks very much to my old friend, Professor Krapel, and uh, for having me here at the uh, University of Florida. Nice to see you all. Thanks for coming out uh, to hear about Brexit. Now, you, you may just want to talk about what the hell is going on right in, right now with Brexit and the House of Lords, and we're at the end game. We'll, I'll get to a little bit of that, but I'm going to save most of that for the Q&A. So really, you know, when we come down to it, you can ask me all those questions about how this might play out. But I thought, for the purpose of this talk, um, you know, take a little bit of a step back, uh, as Professor Capel said, and kind of try to put the uh, Brexit crisis of the EU in a broader context. Think, think about how it relates to the other challenges the EU has been facing in, in recent years. So we'll, we'll come at it from that angle. Uh, so the perfect storm. You, you uh, may have heard this term. Uh, in fact, you know, there's a movie, The Perfect Storm, right? Marky Mark is in there, some others, right? Uh, but, you know, it relates to a real storm. It's based on um, actual events. And, you know, in short, the idea of a perfect storm was the idea that when three different storm systems, you know, intersected, they created the, the sums uh, uh, greater than you know, just the parts put together, right? and it created this incredible storm that had never been seen before. And really, uh, what I want us to think about today is how uh, the EU has kind of had its own uh, perfect storm of intersecting crises in recent years. So let's think about the five main crises you know, that the EU has had and, and think about how just like those three different storm systems coming together, these crises have intersected with each other in ways that you know, intensified one another uh, and, and made the, the collective crisis even greater. So first, of course, the Eurozone crisis. And that's what I'm you know, I'd say it's kind of the beginning of this you know, perfect storm. The first gathering storm starts in 2009-10, really, with the Eurozone crisis, uh, first affecting uh, Greece most intensely, uh, Ireland, other countries on the periphery. And even now, you know, there's been, the, I'd say, of course, the Eurozone crisis isn't at its peak. Uh, it's been, some aspects have been resolved, but it's still lingering, and there's still worries uh, that it could resurface in countries like Italy with the banking system. So the Eurozone crisis was the beginning. Secondly, of course, big one we've been talking about a lot, I'm sure you've hosted talks here in Florida, about the refugee crisis. Okay? That peaked 2015, 2016, but it's far from resolved. Although they put in place some policies and measures to try to address it, you know, the refugee crisis is still um, lingering there in the background. There's still refugees coming, dying at sea, and uh, you know, the numbers may resurge at any time, any summer, right? So that's there in the background, okay? Uh, Brexit, of course, our main topic today, uh, then is, is another big crisis for all the reasons we'll get to. Uh, and, you know, next, maybe the next two crises you might have heard a little less about, but actually are very, very serious, in some ways maybe more existential for the EU, especially number five, which I'll get to, but uh, it, number one is, uh, number four here is the crisis of what I call Russian aggression. Now that's both in the situation in Ukraine, but more generally, uh, as I'll explain, Russia basically, the Putin regime really has as a principal foreign policy objective to divide and if he could sort of destroy the EU, right? And this takes many dimensions, right? Uh, infiltrating the EU to support populist far-right parties, um, more generally, you know, even infiltrating to support Brexit, Brexit as we'll see, uh, and more generally trying to sort of plant Trojan horse regimes within the EU to divide from within. So there's that pressure uh, from Russia. And then finally, there's a democracy crisis, which really has sort of two dimensions. One, the rise of populist far-right Eurosceptic movements in the EU, uh, in all across the EU, you know, from, from Western Europe and France, and now even Spain has a Eurosceptic populist party, uh, to, of course, Eastern Europe, where this trend is taken on, oh, thank you, uh, taken on even a different form. So it's not just about the rise of populist parties and getting some you know, support at the polls, etc., but you've actually had uh, some of these parties capture uh, control of government and actually take governments such as Hungary is the most extreme. I gave a talk about that earlier today, some of you there, or Poland, where they've actually uh, sort of taken these from being pluralist democracies and slid them toward a kind of soft hybrid authoritarianism right there within the EU. All right, so you have all these crises, okay, and the perfect storm is you know, the way that all five of these crises have you know, intersected with one another, right? So you know, each of them linking with each other in different ways. Now, 
uh, most of this talk, we're going to get back to Brexit and dive in there, but so that, give me a moment for the kind of theoretical part of the talk, right? You know, the, to, to think about this question, you know, which is our main question today. How has Brexit been affected by and in turn affected the other crises of this perfect storm? That's really what I want to talk to you about. So the kind of, um, yeah, well, the theory I'll get to in a second, but just to say, you know, the EU's confronted these crises, and if you were in a perfect storm, you'd want like a big naval destroyer like that or something, right? That's what you would want. But that's not what the EU has, right? This is kind of the ship the EU has, right? It's got this kind of half-built institutions, right? It's not, you know, a country. It doesn't have uh, kind of fully formed institutions to deal with things like migration. To doesn't have a fully united foreign policy to deal with foreign aggressors. It doesn't you know, have a, a full economic and monetary union to underpin a, current, underpin a currency. It has these kind of half-built institutions, and it's trying to confront and navigate this perfect storm. And, you know, many people are, are worried that this concatenation of uh, crises could destroy the EU. So just these are a few quotes from EU leaders. I don't even know if you can read that if the font's too small. I apologize. But, you know, you have people, um, you know, like... Uh, Angela Merkel saying, you know, the Eurozone crisis is an existential, life or death crisis for the EU. Uh, the incoming commissioner, Jean-Claude Juncker, said this is the last chance commission, like last chance to save the EU from its crises in 2014. Donald Tusk, president of the, uh, of the council, the refugee crisis is an, again, existential, life or death crisis for the EU. We must solve this. And, you know, it's always implied, or the EU could somehow blow apart and, you know, die. So the ship could sink, right? in this perfect storm. But you know, then other people have said, well, um, you know, the EU actually has advanced through crises, right? Uh, Professor Krapel had on her desk the memoirs of Jean Monnet. We both have these Jean Monnet chairs, one of the founders of the EU. And you know, he famously said back in 70, I guess that was in his memoirs probably, we said that, right? Europe will be forged in crises and will be the sum of solutions adopted for these crises, right? So there the logic is, you know, states are reluctant to delegate authority to the EU, right? They jealously guard their authority, their sovereignty. So it'll only be when there's a big crisis that they can't handle that they'll decide to give the EU some more power. So that's his logic, right? So, you know, then we have to think, well, you know, is there, are these existential crises that could destroy the EU, or is this just how the EU progresses through crises? Well, so this is the theory part I was mentioning, is that, you know, I've done some work you know, thinking about like how the EU may progress through crises. And so just to talk you through this little chart, you know, I think often what happens with the EU, with crises, is that the leaders of the EU, they, they can't really agree on things very readily. They have disagreements. So they always kind of come to a lowest common denominator bargain, right? So uh, it means that, you know, they, they can't maybe agree to set up a fully fledged migration policy, to give you an example, right? So, you know, they agreed, let's get rid of internal borders, so just to give you an example, right? So free movement within the EU, Schengen area, they call it. We're going to have no border checks. They can agree on that, but they couldn't agree to put the EU in charge of the external borders of Europe, like you would in a real federal system, right, where you'd have free internal movement between states and the feds would guard the external border. They couldn't agree on that, so each country guarded its own external border, and just in that example, you know, that gives you half-baked institutions, kind of like half-built ship, right? And then those half-built institutions create their own problems where, you know, one country like Greece is letting people in, not checking them, you know, the problem gets intensified, and then you have a new crisis, right? And then you all get together at some midnight meeting, same thing happened with the euro, right? And you say, oh my goodness, the euro is going to collapse, you know, what do we do? And so then you have another bargain, you create some new institutions. It's kind of like you're at sea on that ship and you're like putting on some extra siding and trying to keep, you know, patch up the holes. But, uh, and then you just go through this cycle. Okay, so EU often progress through that cycle, right? What if, you know, a crisis in one area, in one policy, creates problems in a new area? So what if like your migration crisis helps lead to Brexit? Or what if your migration crisis fuels a democracy crisis like the rise of right-wing populists, right? Because you can't handle this important issue and it's feeding into another crisis, right? So then what if you go off your circle? Well, then you get this. That's like the perfect storm, nightmare, right? Where all these crises, you know, migration crisis, democracy crisis, Eurozone crisis, Brexit, 
there are all these arrows leading from one to another. We can talk about, and I, I don't have time to talk about all of them, where one is feeding into the other. Okay, and you just look, that's like the worst chart ever. You look at that, and you just like scream, right? The famous Norwegian painting, the scream, Edvard Munch. Well, okay, now let's talk about Brexit, because, um, you know, there's many poignant things going on with Brexit and timing and all these things that are like, you couldn't, like today, you know, the House of Lords sprung a leak, and so they had to stop their debates, and, you know, right? And basically, my main theme with Brexit is you just couldn't make this stuff up, right? Like, this, it's just crazy what's happening, right? Well, so the screen, right? Well, look what painting just came last month uh, to London, right? Uh, the screen, and people have been having a fun time with that because it was time to come, like, right before Brexit, you know, and traveling museums, like, and, uh, you know, people have been doing magazine covers like that. Theresa May, you know, trying to deal with Brexit and the scream. So uh, let's think about how, you know, the perfect storm, that nightmare chart, you know, relates to Brexit and how it ties into other crises. So let's first think about the perfect storm and the causes of Brexit. So how did other crises help spark Brexit? There, before I get to that fully, I just want to say, because you might... I don't know, you're having other talks on Brexit. I don't know if anyone has kind of addressed the question, what caused Brexit? Over, but you know, I think like, like a lot of things in life and in, in social science, when you say like, what caused something to happen? There's many factors. I think about it, like when you see a building collapse, just think about it this way, right? That's like a British building, you know, collapse. Um, kind of like the UK now. Uh, you think about that, well, there's short-term and long-term causes, right? Maybe it was vacant for a long time. No one fixed the roof. You know, you had gradual deterioration, bugs, animals got in, plants started growing, and all these long-term things, and it may have to do with the political economy of the town. There's high unemployment. There's, you know, all these structural factors. And then there may be the short-term things. There was a massive rainstorm. I don't know, some kids went in there and played with fire and burned some. So there can be, you know, all these things, short and long-term causes can lead to a, a, a final outcome like Brexit. So I'm not gonna try to give you the whole story of why Brexit happened, but I, I just wanna run through a couple factors, you know, before we get to the perfect storm things, just to, you know, get us thinking about it, maybe give some fuel for Q&A later. You know, look, there's long-term causes for Brexit, right? The, rising anti-EU feeling, Euroscepticism in the Conservative Party. That's just a picture to remind you. you. You all recognize who that is in the middle. It's like the most famous British politician, you would all, other than Churchill, you all know. Margaret Thatcher wearing this sweater with all different EU flags. That's back when she and the Conservative Party were campaigning to join the European Union, or what was then um, you know, called the uh, European Economic Community. Uh, and I guess the point being, you know, back Back then, uh, conservatives were pro-EU, but there's been a long story, which I won't tell you, of how they turned against the EU more and more, and that feeling rose. So that's a long-term trend you know, for decades, right? You also had the rise of this new anti-EU party, UKIP, Nigel Farage, right? And that put pressure on the conservatives because they were taking away votes, and that's you know, been since uh, 1993. So that's another long-term cause that led up to Brexit. Just the Eurosceptic press in the UK blaming uh, you know, Murdoch and his papers and others for everything. You had that for decades, kind of shifting public opinion against the EU. So there's these long-term trends. There's also short-term trends that have nothing to do with the perfect storm, right? They just had some bad leadership at the time that these decisions came up. You know, I'm, uh, that's a picture from Eton. You ever heard of Eton? That's the most fancy, like, private high school in the UK. And that's like this club. The guy on the left is David Cameron, right? It was the Prime Minister at the time of Brexit referendum. And the guy on the right in the circle is Boris Johnson, right? Who um, uh, was Mayor of London and proved to be a key figure in Brexit because he at the last minute turned, uh, surprise people said he was for Brexit and you know, uh, led the Leave campaign and he was a popular politician. And why I show it is basically part of the things that happened were like personal rivalry. They've been frenemies since high school. Right, those two guys, and some of the things that were going on with Brexit were rivalry for leadership. You know, on the left, you've got Jeremy Corbyn, um, you know, who's kind of a old school, unreconstructed socialist who hated the EU. So if they would have had different leaders in the Labour Party at the time, you know, maybe it could have been stopped. So bad leadership. You know, uh, Cameron was famously a gambler, took this big risk, calling the referendum. So there's all these kind of short-term factors. There were, the Leave campaign lied incredibly, making all these outlandish promises, which you know turned out to be false. You know things like that. Um, but 
With all that said, all those factors, the perfect storm and the intersection of Brexit with these other crises was crucial. Like, I don't think Brexit vote would have gone the way it did, you know, and the things would have played out the way they had if you hadn't had these other crises. So that's what I really want us to focus on. So, you know, oops. first thing, think about the Eurozone crisis. Again, I'm not going to tell you the story of the Eurozone crisis, but essentially the, um, the EU's uh, trials and tribulations in coming to terms with the debt crisis and the Eurozone crisis from 2010 onward had an incredibly bad effect on public support for the EU. So in the context of the Eurozone crisis, what this chart shows you is percentage of people who say they trust the EU. Blue is, um, uh, sorry, before, uh, oh sorry, percent who say they do not trust the EU. Blue is before, yellow is after. So what you see uh, after the crisis, so 2007, 2012. So what you see is that levels of distrust in the EU all across Europe, including in the UK, surged, right, to unprecedented levels of distrust uh, because of the poor handling, mismanagement uh, of the Eurozone crisis and perception that, you know, the EU and the Euro were, uh, it was being led by inept people and it was damaging the economies, etc. So that, you know, affected the UK. Then you had the refugee crisis, Right, if you look, this is, shows you the numbers of migrant and refugee arrivals to, um, uh, to the EU, principally to Italy, Greece, and Spain, which are main countries of arrival. And you just see how it surged, particularly in Greece, right, where you had over a million people arrive in the EU, refugees, in 2015. And in you know, early 2016, right in the run-up to the referendum, numbers were very high, too. And so, you know, again, this... Uh, uh, the fears about the refugee crisis uh, intermingled with existing xenophobia and concern about immigrants in the UK. Uh, you know, you had these images, people coming on boats, all that, these columns of people marching across Europe trying to, you know, uh, get to, uh, you know, Western Europe. And uh, the, the Leave campaign picked up on that. So, I mean, you see these images, people marching, right? And this is Nigel Farage, where you know, they're campaigning and Leave campaign saying, you know, the EU is at a breaking point. That picture, by the way, you know, is a picture from Slovenia, right? So, in, in fact, it has, like, really nothing to do with the UK because they didn't have to open their borders to the refugees, right? This was, and they're not part of the free movement Schengen area, but those are all details that, you know, were swept under the rug by the Leave campaigners who were just picking up on the fears and all the um, concern about the inability of the EU to handle this refugee crisis and saying, see, you know, they're opening up the doors, exposing us, you know, to these risks. Let's get out. And, you know, this is, um, talking about leave lying, this was one of the brochures that they were sending around, you know, flyers sending around to houses in the run-up to the campaign. I mean, look at this image. They say, countries set to join the EU, which first of all is like a lie um, because these countries aren't set to join the EU. Secondly, uh, you need unanimous agreement for any new country to join. So by definition, the UK could have vetoed anyone joining, right? But what do they show? You know, they're kind of combining fears about migration, Islamophobia, etc. And they're just showing, like, what's on this map, right? The UK, like, then the kind of, they whitewash out the rest of Europe is just kind of like gray, faded in the back. And then they basically sh showing, you know, uh, Turkey. And then, and funnily enough, see Syria and Iraq aren't even like in the discussion about ever joining the EU, right? But they kind of put them on the map because there's like, you know, war in Syria. And basically, you know, the message is, if we stay in the EU, 76 million Turks might move to our country. You know, it's kind of the, the message they're sending. So they're playing on these fears, right? And, uh, you know, that was crucial. You know, one of the, the top, really the biggest issue, along with, there's other concerns, but it was immigration in terms of motivating leave voters. And so you can't separate that concern you know, from these fears uh, about the crisis. And when you look, this chart's for, too small for you to see, but here's what I want to point out. The blue, this is the question, if there was a referendum on Britain's membership in the EU, how would you vote? And this is over time from 2015 to uh, middle of 2018, okay? And what you see is that at most points in time, in the last few years, right? There is a majority for Remain, the blue line. But look at the timing. It was right then, around you know, 2016 June, when they took the vote, 
when for this brief period, you know, partly because of the campaigns and the Leave campaign was more effective, et cetera, that you had uh, Leave overtake Remain, and then it's dropped down, and now actually Remain, if they voted tomorrow, you know, looks like it would be ahead. But I guess the point is, you know, this was a very close run thing, and this timing of these other events being in crisis were crucial for them, the Leavers, to push it over the edge. Okay, so that, we talked about migration crisis a lot, we talked a little bit about Eurozone crisis, how about the, the crisis of Russia and Russian meddling uh, and how that affected Brexit? This is a little bit more, um, let's say, uncertain. We don't have all the facts here, just like we don't have the facts about the Mueller inquiry. Because you know, there's a lot of talk about the Mueller inquiry, but by people who haven't read it, right? Because none of us have read it, so we don't really know. But anyway, we'll get back to that. Uh, Russia and Brexit. So, you know, why does Putin hate, hate the EU? Putin sees the EU as a kind of existential threat for his regime. The EU, you know, out there supposedly at least tries to promote democracy, free markets, all that. You know, he has an authoritarian, kleptocratic regime. And, you know, when, when he saw, like, the countries like, you know, Ukraine or countries on the periphery of Europe getting pulled toward uh, kind of democracy and free markets and that sort of thing, that, that kind of scared him, the, the famous color revolutions in Eastern Europe. He didn't want a color revolution in Russia that might depose him, so you know, he really set out to try to divide and weaken and, you know, if he could, destroy the EU. Because also, you know, essentially, uh, even in economic terms, you know, he wants to sell gas and oil to the EU. The more united they are, right, the stronger they can be vis-a-vis -vis his regime, the more divided, weak they are, you know, the, the stronger he can be, right? So he wants to weaken and destroy the EU. So what does he do? Lots of things we can't talk about. Extensive spying. Brussels is like a hotbed of spies, right? Just FYI. Lot, lots of Russian spies, you know, leaking and influence operations through, you know, uh, basically cyber uh, techniques. They support far-right and Euroskeptic parties, including UKIP, which we'll come to, the UK Independence Parties in Europe. Uh, they do propaganda uh, through networks like RT and Sputnik and social media, you know, always kind of uh, highlighting these crises, talking about the EU could break apart, supporting these far-right parties. They do election hacking. You might have heard, for instance, how Macron, the last presidential election, had a very clever cyber thing to counter the Russian efforts uh, to you know, influence the uh, French election against him to support Le Pen against him. You know, so the national rally, which is used to be called the National Front, the far right party in France, right? No bank in Europe would serve as their bank because they're links to like neo Nazism, etc. So of course their bank is a uh, bank from Russia, closely aligned with Putin, right? So that's the kind of thing he's doing. And then finally, to get to you know our point, Brexit, right? The Russian government was a huge cheerleader for Brexit, and well, what did we, what did they do? We don't know exactly. I mean, we know it goes back a long time. Nigel Farage was a regular, uh, well-paid guest on the RT network for years before Brexit, right? So UKIP was always supported uh, by. He he once said that the leader he admired most in the world was Putin, right? Um, and when you get down to the campaign, this is where it gets murky. Read The Guardian, Carol Kalad Walader, I can't say her name very well, uh, is the reporter who's done the most on this, um, where essentially the campaign for leaving uh, the EU, the Leave campaign, was mostly financed by this guy named Aaron Banks, who uh, the sources of his wealth are very murky. He donated, uh, his donation to fund the Leave campaign was the biggest ever donation in the history of British politics. Right, and there's a lot of speculation uh, that you know that donation was indirectly channeled to him through Russia, but we don't know yet. Okay, we don't know at all uh, for sure. But you know there was a series of meetings between him and other leaders of the Leave campaign with the Russian ambassador, various Russian business interests who dangled uh, uh, deals, you know, uh, for him uh, you know, in the run up to the campaign. So it's all very murky. I'm not gonna, you know. I don't claim that we know the whole thing. Russians offered business deals to Brexit, Brexit's biggest backer, New York Times. You know, uh, this Carol Kellogg Water writing about you know why Britain should really have its own version of a Mueller inquiry to see how much. And I mean, just think about the timing. We know that Russia was pro, um, whether or not there's collusion. Leave that aside. In our country, we know right. All our intelligence agencies have agreed right that Russia tried to manipulate our election right to um, you know oppose Clinton, support Trump right. Well, 
it was at the same time as the Brexit referendum. You know, why on earth would they not be trying, you know, to influence the Brexit referendum when it's even in a way more crucial for them? So, you know, this needs to be looked into. But here's a funny story. Why haven't they launched the Mueller inquiry? Why haven't they done more to investigate it? Well, guess who was Home Secretary when people were pressing to have, you know, a, a big inquiry done into Brexit campaign financing? Uh, a certain person who's now the Prime Minister of the UK called Theresa May. And she blocked all requests for launching an inquiry into Brexit, right, uh, when she was Home Secretary. And the, these requests came from British intelligence services who wanted to launch this, uh, you know, inquiry, and she blocked it as Home Secretary. So we don't know, okay? Uh, it'll come out maybe someday when it's too late. Okay, so that's, you know, some of the ways that the perfect storm contributed to Brexit. How about the other way? I should look at my watch, how far will we along here? Okay, we got, we got time. Um, did Brexit contribute to the EU's perfect storm? So the other direction, not how the perfect storm contributed to Brexit, but did Brexit contribute to the perfect storm? Well, yes, a bit. In, in one sense, in a kind of meta sense, it did that Brexit, as you can see in the newspapers, right, has been soaking up so much energy, attention, focus of EU leaders. So many of their summits are focused on how to deal with the UK. So that, of course, naturally diverted attention from dealing with other crises. So just to give one example, what I talked about earlier today at the law school with this crisis of uh, the uh, kind of regimes uh, dismantling the rule of law and democracy in Eastern Europe, like in Hungary and Poland. You know, the fact that the EU leaders were so fixated in the last few years, uh, last couple of years with Brexit, meant they didn't, uh, you know, have the energy to, and, and uh, attention to focus on those crises. That was part, you know, of what was going on there. So certainly that's been true to some extent. And I'll tell you, it's one that I was kind of surprised by, frankly. You know, when I knew Brexit would be terrible for the UK, right? But I thought it would also be pretty bad for the EU and cause a lot of problems, spill over into these other crises. But actually, my main kind of conclusion is, you know, a, a lot less than we would have thought. And in fact, Brexit, in some surprising ways, has actually given the EU a boost, right? Um, so what do I mean? Well, look, let's go back. This is before the Brexit vote, right? And this is a survey. Again, I apologize. These are a bit small, but I'll just talk you through what this says. Right, that, uh, this was a survey asking people in different countries, you got Sweden, Denmark, Norway, France, Germany, uh, Great Britain, Finland, where they asked people, if Britain decides in this referendum to leave the EU, do you think other countries might follow? So like, will there be a domino effect? And what you see in blue is you thought that's likely, green is you think it's unlikely. Look, everywhere people thought it was likely there would be a domino effect, right? And I remember giving talks around the time, I'm sure Professor Capel, same thing, everyone's like, who's going to leave next, right, and all that. You know, look, in Sweden, 70% of people thought there could be, you know, or it was likely there'd be a domino effect. Uh, France, 55%. So people thought this, right, and there was a lot of worry there could be this spillover into other cri uh, crises or the EU unraveling, right? But that hasn't happened. How is Brexit seen now from the EU? You know, it is a big dumpster fire, right? And so, you know, a funny thing happened on the way to the domino effect and the unraveling, which is, in fact, just the opposite happened, right? Because essentially, as people watched the uh, debacle, right, that is unfolded or is still unfolding in the UK, the economic damage, the political chaos, everything that's happening, it kind of gave them a renewed appreciation for the EU. You know, when they saw even like the process of negotiation, the perceptions, I just saw another survey, I didn't put the data up here, when they said, like, who seems to have the upper hand in negotiations? And, like, every single country, overwhelmingly, people recognize, oh, it's the EU. So you had, this is a famous early picture from one of the first, I think this is the first negotiating meeting between the two negotiating teams. On the left is the EU team led by Michel Barnier, uh, the French former finance minister who leads the EU. And on the right uh, it was David Davis in the middle, who subsequently quit as Brexit secretary, right? They've all, a few of them have quit, right? But people always joke about this picture, because what do you notice about the picture? The EU comes there with all their papers, and they prepped everything, they got all their positions lined up, and like the guys from Brexit, they're like smiling, they're cheery, they're like, they didn't bring any documents, at least, and it might not be true, but that was the way the picture was interpreted. And I guess the point is that people, you know, came to, you know, see, well, the EU's actually handling this thing pretty well, pretty competent, Barnier's been very respected, 
And what you saw quite quickly, this is just a short-term thing showing, you know, in the 2000s up to 2017. See how all those lines go up suddenly? Well, this is, you know, favorability of the EU in different countries. And what you saw from 2016, when the Brexit vote happened to 2017, there was a sudden spike all across the EU. I think it was in like 26 of 28 member states that support for the EU jumped up. Because basically people thought, oh yeah, actually, you know, maybe the EU is not so bad. Maybe we don't want to like spit all over the EU all the time, blame because you know it's got some uh, benefits that we realize when we see Brexit happening. This um, is you know another survey data showing this is from 2007 to 18. Taking everything into account, would you say that our country, you know, whatever country the person's from, has on balance benefited from um, uh, or sorry, benefited or not from being a member of the EU? The blue line is we benefited, red line is we didn't benefit. And here's the point. L the last year, 2018, the perception that your country benefits from the e being in the EU hit a 35-year high. Okay? So, you know, from those doldrums of uh, the period r after the uh, Eurozone crisis into the refugee crisis, we've had a resurgence in people saying they benefit uh, from the EU. This is another similar chart. Do you think... Uh, uh, it's a good thing or bad thing for your country to be in the EU. Uh, you know, the, again, good thing, you know, being more than uh, five times higher than the percent who think it's a bad thing, right? So, you know, basically support for the EU is jumping up. And also support for the Euro. You know, the Eurozone crisis knocked a lot of the faith in the Euro, but that's jumped back up too. So now approval for the Euro currency is at its highest level since 2004. Okay, so, you know, even in these countries that have had high unemployment racked by the crisis, people are, are glad to be in the euro and have that as their currency. So, uh, sorry, there we go. Okay, so number one thing, public support's gone up. Number two thing, this is the one that surprised me the most, I have to say, is that there's a lot of worries that, okay, maybe there'll be, like, divisions within the EU. And look, Theresa May has tried to foster those divisions. Her big negotiation strategy for a couple years was when the EU said, we have a common position, we've told Michel Barnier what our common position is, and you have to negotiate with him, she would fly around to the separate national capitals trying to cut side deals and divide the EU. But they were having none of it. You know, this was a summit they held in uh, Bratislava in Slovakia right after the, the no vote or the leave vote, and they right away came out with a strong statement, we will remain united, no one else is leaving, we'll have a common position, we're sad they're going, but, you know, we're going to march on together and even deepen integration. So, you know, to kind of counter the narrative of the EU is going to splinter apart, they say, no, no, we're going to stick together and even deepen. Um, and, you know, you've seen that in particular policy areas since the Brexit vote. Again, I'm not going to go into detail on any of these, but like on defense integration, which has always been, you know, you might have seen the papers, sometimes people talk about this as a Europe, creating a European army. That's kind of a, a silly term, but it, it's more generally the idea that they should cooperate more in defense and security. Well, again, after Brexit, they took, you know, this was a carefully cultivated image of the then French president and Merkel and the, the then um, uh, Italian prime minister, you know, saying we're going to push ahead with defense cooperation on a, they're on an aircraft carrier, right? But, you know, in fact, they did, and they, they launched then by 2017 uh, this defense pact uh, called PESCO, but the point is that they took uh, big new steps on cooperation in defense that they hadn't been able to take for years. And so part of that was motivated to like show we're not going to fall apart, right? On re the refugee crisis, they've had a lot of problems, but they have taken some big steps. So they created a new European border and coast guard to have more of a common a system for patrolling the external borders of the EU. In fact, just last week they uh, uh, announced that to bolster this new institution, this common EU border guard, they're hiring 10,000 EU border agents to work on you know, ships and then to be sent to countries when there's periods of influx of refugees to help process them. So they are creating more central capacity than they ever had. You know, they never had anything like this before at all. Right? So, you know, you may have heard this idea that the EU is going to splinter you know, it looks like they're actually unifying on some of these issues. And, you know, even on the rule of law crisis, where I talk about today, they're having a lot of problems not doing what they should. But, you know, they are taking steps. 
uh, forward there. Uh, this is just from yesterday, April 3rd uh, newspaper. The EU announced its plans for giving itself new tools to um, uh, sort of resist when member states start attacking the rule of law and to strengthen its central capacity, again, to deal with these issues. So, okay, so the EU has not splintered. You know, it, it is managed, in fact, to deepen in some areas. So I don't think the spillover has been that bad. So last couple thoughts, and then I'll wrap up and we have some questions. You know, we are nearing the end game, and you may, may have questions. We were just talking before, is this a game of chicken? You know, basically what Brexit has shown is, you know, you can leave the EU if you want, right? Uh, but it's going to be costly. So the, the whole narrative that the EU is just you know, takes your money, imposes these rules on you, no benefits, you know, that's kind of been shown to be false. And it's also been shown that, you know, the EU can remain united as a powerful actor. And, you know, basically there's been a game of chicken between the UK and the EU about the terms of its Brexit, you know, and what would be the terms of its departure in any new deal. You know, it turns out when you deal with the EU, it's asymmetric chicken. You know, the EU is that train, and the car is, you know, a member state who, you know, tries to you know, wants to leave and stand up. And so I don't think anyone is following them out the door. So to conclude, right, the EU has advanced through crisis, as we said, but the perfect storm has made that more problematic. There have been these interactions that have created problems. But, uh, and, the, and the perfect storm did contribute to Brexit, but Brexit hasn't had the kind of spillover effects on, on other problems that we might have uh, expected. It hasn't capsized the EU the way all those people predicted there would be a domino effect. It just hasn't happened. And so, you know, keep all this in mind. Next time you hear, you know, someone saying the EU is going to die, um, you get all these stories. There's Time Magazine, 2011, right, during the Eurozone crisis. The decline and fall of Europe. We all hear these things, right? Um, here's a favorite. I have this in my office, uh, Amy, right? That's a... a there are eight yeah. economist covers decline yeah. the fall of the EU. Yeah, so this is from uh, 1982 or 83, yeah. sorry, uh, 82, cover of The Economist from 1982, back when the EU was called the European Economic Community, right, EEC, and it's a tombstone, right, saying like the EEC is dead, you know, it's moribund, it's uh, on its way out the door. Well, I'd say the union that's more likely to die and explode these days is the union called the United Kingdom, right, than the union of Europe. Okay, thanks very much.